I would talk to you. I didn't, I didn't know what, what would go on. When it comes to, to, to what we do in the aphasia class, it's like, it's home there. Because I can sit there and know that somebody else is like me. part of the clinic and I'm really happy to be working with these fantastic people. You know, they were all very modest in introducing <laughs> themselves, but they're among the best clinical staff that we could ask for. And I've been in a lot of universities and a lot of settings. I'm new to PC, just started a couple of years ago with Dr. Yaus. Um, so these are most, um, among the most talented clinical staff that I have encountered in a lot of really great universities. So and uh, so dysphagia, as uh, Ms. Wagner said, is a, uh, a disorder of swallowing. And you may think, why do even speech pathologists treat dysphagia, right? Um, you would think more like the aphasia or speech and language, articulation problems are more common. Well, actually, this is a very new area of uh, speech and language pathology or subspecialty. And the reason why we kind of took it over as speech pathologists is because we really know the anatomy. So 
the structures and how they function of the head and neck area really, really well. And uh, that was one of the reasons why uh, we started looking at swallowing as well. A lot of the patients that Bernadine uh, described that have a stroke, they were coming to us and they were not being, they were not being fed orally by mouth. They were having tubes through their stomachs and they were being fed by a tube. And I don't know if you ever have encountered that, but that's a very, very important limitation to your quality of life. Um, so um, a couple of really great people from the Midwest, uh, speech pathologists and uh, professors, they started looking into that and they said maybe we can help them. And that's how the field was born in the early 80s. So in the, uh, in the last uh, you know, 23 years now, 30, 33 years, right? Yeah, 33 years, I'm sorry. Yeah. 33 years now, um, we've really come a long way and I'm, uh, um, I'm really grateful to say that I have been trained by these people that started the field. So I'm, uh, uh, I was really excited to come here and start something new to try and help people uh, with uh, uh, swallowing problems. I would not be able to do that without these amazing people that are just sitting here. So I'm really grateful for that. So um, I want to say a couple of things about our equipment. We do have, uh, with the college's support and the programs and the department support, we have state-of-the-art evaluation equipment and treatment equipment. So we can really help significantly people of different age groups. We do try to follow evidence-based practice. That means that we do try to use protocols that have been researched out there. Not just protocols that come to our mind and say, okay, let's try this, right? We want to make sure that we try things that actually have been shown to be working for patients. We do also develop new exciting treatment programs. That's why we, that's the really nice thing about the clinic is that we really have a perfect marriage between clinical application and research. Very, very rare in graduate programs of speech and language pathology. Um, and as uh, uh, Lee said already, we do all this, but, um, and at the same time, we provide hands-on training to uh, students who are going to go out there and practice in medical fields and the medical placements that they get. Um, and that's really unique, uh, and I know that Dr. Yaus mentioned that before. We are really the only, as far as we know, the only dysphagia research clinic in an academic setting in the U.S. in a speech and language pathology program outside a hospital. So most clinics are in a hospital. Uh, we are the only one in an academic setting. So this is really, really unique and great. Okay, so I'm just gonna show a couple of pictures. Uh, so you see we have endoscopy equipment. Endoscopy is, uh, is a type of equipment that uses a small cable with a camera that goes through, your, goes through your nose and all the way down to your throat. And we can look at your throat. We can look at, look at the structures, how your voice box looks. We can look at how you swallow. Uh, you swallow water, some of you have seen swallow water, we would be able to see that, if everything goes down okay, or if there's any problems. So we have that here. It's very, very unique and a, a really high quality endoscope. We provide supervision, and I know that from the video you got the idea, so we do the same thing as in the aphasia groups. We are involved in both pediatric and adult treatment, and Bernadine actually, Ms. Gannon, is very, very uh, helpful, and uh, I know she talked about the aphasia groups, but she is a fantastic pediatric dysphagia specialist as well. So we really do uh, and offer a lot of services while at the same time providing uh, uh, training and um, conducting research. And the last thing I want to talk about briefly, I don't want to take up uh, too much time, is uh, our telepractice initiative. And this goes um, across the different areas in the clinic, but I will present what we are doing uh, through the dysphagia clinic, so <coughs> again for swallowing disorders. So we can provide uh, services over the internet as long as the patient has internet, a good internet connection at home and a relatively good quality camera and microphone at home. Because it's very important to us to be able to see really well, right? And hear really well the voice of the patients while we're evaluating them or treating them. We do use a special software that is uh, compliant with HIPAA, that's the, the health, health privacy and confidentiality law. Basically, <laughs> um, um, that means that we do protect the privacy and confidentiality of our patients to the best of our ability. Whenever you use the internet, you know, there is, there is an amount of risk, but our patients know that and, and most of them are, are willing to take the risk for the benefits that they're getting because they don't need to come in here. And we can evaluate patients from all over the world. So we do telepractice with Greece. We do, I come from Greece, so we do telepractice with Greece. We do telepractice, as you see in the, in the videos, with England. Um, so we're really proud of that and we are going to be expanding that to other services. So I'm going to very briefly play a couple of videos. You'll see a kid that we just saw, um, a couple of weeks ago.
ago, and and he is um, he's in England with his mom. He's gonna get that from the accent too. And um, in the beginning, you'll just hear a very short clip of him speaking and saying some words. So I was really evaluating his articulation, his resonance, just how he sounds. And then you can actually see him eating in the, uh, where I was able to make observations. And we were able to make observations. You can see me and Dr. Shepard, uh, 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 or our other pediatric specialist, um, guiding the telepractice. But for the sake of really uh, getting more information of the kid, the camera will focus on the kid. So I don't know if we can play the first one. Just, uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Right that's okay. <laughs> yes, that's right. And can you name all the animals that you see? Disabilities. 
and also my young at heart attitude <laughs> as a, a camper. Um, so this summer, the Mind Academy is proud to introduce uh, Community Camp, which is a camp, a mini camp, uh, for one week for children between the ages of 6 and 16 who use Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AAC. And AAC is an alternative means of communication through the use of pictures, uh, symbols, computers, or speech generating devices for people who are nonverbal, who cannot use words to communicate, just as I am right now. Um, so the mission of our camp is to help children who use AAC to increase their communicative competence, uh, build relationships and socialize with other children who are using AAC, and also provide a fun environment for, for children to engage and socialize um, and learn a few things, hopefully. <laughs> um, so Communicamp will run the last week in July in the afternoon from 3 to 5, and our campers will come in and begin with a small, uh, or a camp, you know, welcome activity each day as a larger group, and then they'll divide into smaller groups based on communicative abilities as well as the different devices that they may be using. Um, each small group will be led by a graduate clinician under the direct supervision of a licensed speech therapist, and that gives our students um, in the graduate program in speech pathology an opportunity to provide speech and language services direct one-on-one -on -one, um, with children of varying disabilities. Um, Likely children who will be joining our camp um, who are using AAC are diagnosed with autism, cerebral palsy, or cognitive communication disorders, um, or cognitive disabilities. So we're looking at a, a wide range of abilities and a wide range of disabilities that we can provide um, a, a great experience for our students. Um, it's going to be its first year this summer, so we're still kind of making all the plans and adjustments um, and working with all of the schedules that we um, have at our clinic, but we're looking forward to it and we think it's going to be a big success. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really it, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really wanted to just provide an overview of some of the services that the MySAC mm -hmm. Clinic um, has and the way that the clinic works. And I think right now we'd like to just uh, thank you for listening and then open up um, for some discussion or questions about the clinic and about some of the services that we provide. Uh, we're frequently asked about the graduate training program and how that might work or how um, certain aspects of that work. So if there are any questions, um, we're happy to talk with you about them. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, for you get to choose where you go for your externships for the, the graduate students who are going through the program. Yes and no, you get to ask. <laughs> so the way that works is that the students uh, have a form they fill out. I'm the person that coordinates all of that. And they have a form that they fill out and uh, during the first uh, semester or two while you're here, you learn a little bit about how the clinic works and what types of services we provide. And students usually start to get an area that they're interested in. Oh, I think I really want to work in a school system with profoundly impaired children who might use AAC, or in a hospital setting where individuals might have swallowing disorders uh, or aphasia. Uh, so um, what happens is I take all of that information and I try to place you in, in a, an area where you're interested. Now, the students start out in less complicated environments, um, you know, perhaps a, a, a school system where the children are not severely profoundly impaired, but, are, um, but need speech and language services. And as they pro progress through the program and uh, move through the experiences in clinical practicum, certainly then they're eligible or, or able to work with more complicated cases with, in more complicated environments like a medical setting. So um, we have, students have three practicums with us, and they complete uh, 400, a minimum of 400 graduate student hours with us. Uh, that's a, a mandate by ASHA, which is the American Speech and Hearing Association, that. Uh, credits our program. 400 hours is a lot of time. It is a lot of time. So when students leave our program, they're very well trained. And I will say that many of our students leave our program with five, six, sometimes 700 hours based on where they come in. So all of our students go to a school system. Um, some of our students, if they're interested, will go to a medical setting. Uh, and then, um, of course, since they have to do three placements, generally, if by the time they get to those placements, they have a, a good idea of an area they want to focus on and are interested in, and we try to provide them some additional training or experience in that. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting to see in the video how uh, melodic, uh, singing melodic intonation therapy has helped stroke 
of survivors. And I've also been reading about Lee Silverman, LSBT. I was wondering if that has been applied to working with children, and has that been effective? I'll let Dr. Melodrahi answer that as that's an okay. purpose. Uh, I guess I don't need the microphone right yet. Um, I'm not sure about the melodic intonation therapy if it has been used in kids, has it? Do you yeah, think? Well, no, the melodic intonation therapy has been used in children with apraxia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Apraxia or motor planning, um, difficulty with motor planning. You know, your articulators can't um, configure themselves in the, the correct format to form words. Um, so it, it has been used in that, but um, there's not a lot of research to show its evidence yet, but it's been um, becoming more and more widely used. And I can tell you about the Lee Silverman voice treatment, uh, the LSVT, which for those of you who don't know, that's a, a voice therapy technique that uses loudness, so it makes you, you know, talk louder, and by that, like, exercising the respiratory as well as the vocal muscles, uh, the voice box muscles. Um, it has been tested in some case series studies in kids with cerebral palsy, uh, as far as I know, but um, yeah, we don't yeah. have and what? And and down down syndrome. Syndrome, but we don't have a lot of evidence. Uh, it's, it's usually case studies or case series, so maybe three or five or three to five children that are included in the papers, but there's still a lot more evidence that we need. And currently, Dr. Olivi, who yep. is um, a professor within our department, she's conducting research using the Lee Silverman voice therapy program with children with um, cerebral palsy or and that have dysarthria, which is um, a speech disorder due to weakness. So we'll have more evidence. <laughs> Any other questions we can answer about the clinic? Do you serve children who are deaf um, or hard of hearing? And if so, um, can you describe if you've been using teletherapy or telepractice? Sure, children who have cochlear implants. Sure. We serve children who have cochlear implants, I'd say, and we have some clients who have hearing impairments. We're not using telepractice because those are clients who come to the clinic. And we're providing some sort of oral rehabilitation and rehabilitation We oh. have. I'm sorry. We have two audiologists also as part of um, our department. One is Dr. Joanne Nicholas and the other is Honor O'Malley. And Dr. Joanne Nicholas teaches our oral rehabilitation class as well as our hearing measurement classes. And she conducts um, hearing evaluations on many of the children and adults in our clinic and um, offers some um, assistance to us in development of treatment plans for some of those children or adults that we see. I want to say also in terms of the telepractice that uh, it's, it's not impossible to do telepractice with those types of individuals. You do need special equipment and to make sure that you, you know, the audio is really, really great quality and the video, of course, um, but it's not impossible. I work at a listening and spoken language school in Pittsburgh and we're using a program developed by the University of Pittsburgh, a special platform that's um, yep. hip compliant yes. and verbal compliant. Yeah. Are you and one of our programs? Um, the organization of leadership. Oh, okay. The uh, University of Pittsburgh is really a, a, has been a leader in telepractice in many ways. So it's great. Any other questions? Oh, I know we have a couple um, prospective students in the audience too. So oh, I think there's a question over there. Uh, you and I are pointing in different directions. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, well. How about if you start, and then we'll. I just wanted. What's, what's the ratio in terms of um, internet? Uh, you know, services that are provided in the internet as opposed to people physically coming into the Well, r right now, it's, uh, we, by, um, by and large, we're really providing face-to-face -face therapy. We have very few clients. We're really testing the telepractice component right now. Mm -hmm. So the ratio is definitely, you know, uh, a lot more toward the face-to-face -face clients. Because we're now, we want to we wanna make sure that we are not, you know, we don't want to use Skype. We don't want to, we want to use, you know, we tested a lot for a year. We were testing different software, and we decided to go with a freely available software so that people can get it freely without paying, and they can use it from their home. Um, but that what that had the requirements that we needed to have to be HIPAA compliant, FERPA compliant, and all of that. And we found that, uh, and now we're testing it. So now we have about two to three clients that are using telepractice, but everybody else is face to face. This is going to change, though. I think it's going to get a lot bigger in the next year or two. Yep, we're going to be opening it up. We're also starting a research project in the fall using telepractice versus face-to-face, -face, and we're going to be comparing reliability and uh, efficacy. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, yeah, you mentioned um, going back to the 
previous question, you mentioned uh, loud therapy. Means of voice therapy. Mm -hmm. And then you said it's due to weakness. What type of weakness do you do? Well, I was talking about dysarthria, which is a motor speech disorder that has to do with weakness of the, the muscles. That results from a neurological insult. So that's what it means. So, so is that common for all children that have a speech problem? Or is that no? No. 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 As, as Dr. Maldrocki said, it, it's something, it has to do with a neurological um, insult of some sort or involvement. Um, that's why patients would have this dysarthria. So there's lots of different types of speech disorders. There's a typical articulation disorders. So there, there's apraxia, which is a motor planning disorder. There's dysarthrias and all the language. And all the language related things too. So, sorry. So if a child has an uh, articulation speech problem, mm -hmm. how do you tackle that? Well, it may be developmental, so they may have um, difficulty learning the new sounds, at, or and they may develop in a atypical pattern. Um, so we we provided an about we likely would start with an evaluation to determine whether it was neurologically based or developmentally based in terms of learning, and then we tackle the treat the client differently depending on the etiology of it. Mm -hmm. Can you back me off of that? Um, for students who have um, really not severe articulation issues, who don't qualify for evaluation for speech services, do you have a place to, that gives like resources, ideas for teachers and parents to help support that development? Yeah, and absolutely. And if Following the evaluation, depending on um, the diagnosis, and the typical age of the child and what's typical in terms of development, we would provide recommendations that they can either do at home. We ourselves can, can provide those recommendations that they can do at home to help the sounds come in on their own or a reassessment at the appropriate time following consistent errors if they continue not to develop appropriately. Can I just add to that? Qualification, you added as an extra statement. Qualification depends on who's making that decision. So mm -hmm. if we diagnose that there's a problem and we're able to provide treatment, even if the school wouldn't fund it or an insurance company wouldn't fund it, that's something that we are able to provide. So it's for private pay. So if a parent, uh, you know, as Elise says, um, if you know if a parent um, wants to have, feels that the services are needed, and we feel that services are needed, and it's ethical to treat the child, even if the child is not eligible for services, <coughs> he or she can come. It's not that, you know, as, as um, you know, was mentioned, if, if you're going through your insurance company, the insurance may deny it. But for us, that's not an issue. And, you know, if, if the child needs the services but they can't afford it, we certainly will help provide those. Thank you. Know, and, reduced costs. And, and a lot of um, patients and families come to our clinic looking for a second opinion that maybe have been denied services previously, like a pediatric evaluation that we had just a few weeks ago. The um, child did not qualify for early intervention services, and um, you know, based on our evaluation, the child clearly needed the services. So we are making a clear justification, you know, and the child will be reevaluated through early intervention with, given our report. Okay. I have a personal situation. My youngest son was evaluated, and he receives uh, speech. It wasn't neurological because he's not in a pressure at classroom, but he's He's regular general ed, and he gets um, speech outside of the classroom. But it's determined that because he's, according to them, intelligent and he's doing well, now they want to reverse that. So, and I don't feel that way. I don't know if it's a parent from a parent standpoint or, you know. So I, I just want to know, if, is there any other way to get him the services because they feel like he's not really needed? Well, I, I, so essentially they're telling me that he doesn't really need the services in the school. And okay, because he's learning really fast. Right. I, you know, I think what you might want to consider would be um, to seek services privately. As we've mentioned, you know, our, our clinic, if, if we did an evaluation and their son needed services, um, you know, certainly if it was ethical for us to treat him, if he needs the services, we'd be happy to provide those. And because we're not uh, mandated by insurance or by the DOE, we can provide those services as long as, um, from an ethical standpoint, by ethical I mean you know, um, the standards of our practice. 
So uh, we did an evaluation with him, and he was, for example, at grade level or at age level, and we can we could clearly say, you know, really the mistakes he's making are age appropriate. If it's not necessary for him to receive services, then we wouldn't just see him just to see him. But if he needed services, if we thought he needed services, certainly we could provide those. why we have the sliding scale available. Um, we really will provide services to anybody who needs them. Um, you know, we, our, our rates, for example, for therapy are, if you come for therapy for an entire semester, which is 16 weeks long, and you receive, uh, you'll receive two sessions a week, it's $600. If you had that many therapy sessions in a private clinic, you'd probably pay upwards of $5,000 for the services. So, or you, you would, that clinic would be billing your insurance and you'd be paying whatever it is, it is allowed. Um, so, you know, that's really, really reduced from the private sector. However, there are some people who can't afford that. And there are some people who can't afford, even if they come once a week, and then of course it's half the cost, which is $300. For some people, $300 over a three month period is a huge stretch. So we have a sliding scale available. Um, everybody is based on, uh, the sliding scale is based on the same um, um, un, 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 unemployment, not unemployment, federal, federal. federal. federal information, sorry. Poverty levels, I'm trying to find, the, 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 the uh, federal poverty level scale. So everybody's evaluated along the same scale, so it's fair and equal across the board. And if, if they're not able to afford services, then um, we will make sure that they get their services for free if needed. Okay, we'll reduce the rate of services based on their qualifications on that scale. But again, if they can't afford it, we will, we will see them for free. And our client base comes from all over New York. We have some people who come, we've had some people who come from New Jersey, uh, come in for, for services from New Jersey, but we draw from all over New York. Uh, we have clients who come in from Long Island, um, from Southern Connecticut, from northern, the northern area of New York, Westchester area, Rockford, Rock, Rockford, Rockford County. County. So we have a pretty big client base. There was a question over here. Yeah, I was just wondering if students who participate in the activities mm -hmm. that's often go back to work after completing the program where they done their job. Sometimes, I think it's just a matter, it's one of those things, timing is everything. If you happen to be at a facility um, and um, they have a position available as you're finishing the program, certainly you may be somebody that, you know, you're right on their radar, so you may be somebody that they'd like to hire, particularly if you do a good job. <laughs> I, can, I can speak from personal experience. My final externship, here as a student, um, I you know applied for a position there that they had open, but at the time um, they decided that they couldn't have a clinical fellowship um, student at that time. So I went to work in a, another hospital for my clinical fellowship year, which is the the nine month um, year following graduation in order to get licensed and certified as a speech pathologist. And then my final field placement contacted me at the end of that externship or that clinical CFY. fellowship of CFY and asked if I would like to, to work there. And so I did. <laughs> and I ended up in my first field placement. Um, I, I ended up taking a clinical fellowship year with my first placement. So I think I think a number of us probably do. Yes. Um, can I add one thing to that too, is that um, a, a large number of our field placement supervisors are TC grads. I would say the greater majority of them are which is a nice thing because they know the program, they know our faculty, we have a good relationship with them. Um, you know, obviously the, the lines of communication are very open there. So it's really nice that when, when our students leave the program and have positions, they're, they're very excited about taking TC students and very committed to our students. So that's, that's a really good point to make that um, a lot of our, our field supervisors are TC guys. Sure. Okay, I'm Brendan
Brendan and I talk regularly. <laughs> so. That's great. Thank you, Brendan, for adding that. That's great. Any other questions? We have just a little bit of time left. I'm happy to talk about anything you guys are interested in about the clinic. I'm glad we had so much. We, we were a little worried that we might run along in the tooth. Um, so I was, I was really actually a little pleased that we had some extra time because you know, we wanted to make sure that there were time to answer questions. Um, well, our, our contact information is up here. The MySec Clinic contact information is there. Um, whether you know, if you're a prospective student or an alum who might have a question or if you know somebody who might need services, certainly you're welcome to send them our way. And the Dysphagia Research Clinic information is there. Um, Elisa's email is there right now, but we just found out yesterday after we handed in these slides that, the, that TC was able to create a, uh, a specialty email for the dysphagia research clinic. So it is just dysphagia clinic at tc.columbia.edu. But you can send an email at least to if you like, and she'd be happy to um, work with us. So um, feel free to be in touch, and we hope to see you all here, uh, moving through the building and through the festival today. So thanks so much for coming.